Now, I mentioned that we're a church that's discipling, raising up leaders, seeing, seeing our young graduates, man, going out and serving. But we also have a, a special guest that you probably know, Chaz Crone, is going to come up, and he's going to actually share the message this morning. And Chaz is our missions deacon. He helped run that missions week last week. He's, man, shared the gospel with our, our youth and, and led some of our youth and kids to the Lord. I mean, done some incredible stuff. He shared at uh, our Good Friday service. And it was a neat one to see. God kind of put it on his heart to be sharing this morning with us and to be a part of that journey. And this is now the second time, because this morning was the first time right. that you've ever shared on a Sunday morning, right? And you're not nervous at all. You're ready to go, right? Yeah. No, no problem. All right. <laughs> No, would, would we just say a quick prayer for him, right? This is a cool Amen. thing that our church gets to be a part of, seeing discipleship happen, seeing God's call and what he's going to do through Chaz. So let's just pray a quick blessing over him. So, Father, we just, again, we come to you, and, and we know that, man, we know where our strength is at, and it's through you. So we just pray for, for your words and strength to flow through Chaz. That he'll be leading and, and teaching and, and just opening up your word and that we would be responding and, and, and hearing the good news and, and what you have to speak to us to meet where we're at right now. Would we hear with open ears and would we see with open eyes as we, as we turn to your word? In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Awesome, Chaz. All right. I'm going to pull a siren up. I'm going to make some use of it today. <clears throat> oh, oh, oh. You're dismissed to Kids Church. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> they let themselves out. <laughs> uh, all right. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Sounds good. Um, the other week, I asked Michael <clears throat> if I could talk about the book of Haggai. Uh, he let me know that I could. So here I am presenting the Word of God presented by Haggai. Uh, I'm excited to share with you all. And now... Let us uh, pray yet again and ask the Lord's hand um, in leading our time. Uh, Lord Jesus, I thank you that um, I get to deliver your message, and I pray that you would speak, uh, that your spirit would uh, bring words out of my mouth, and they would connect with your body, um, that your name would be known, and we would love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so here we go. Uh, Haggai is one of the shorter books of the Old Testament. Um, and one of the reasons why it is so dear to me is because uh, it's one of the, maybe the only time in this latter part of the prophets that the people actually obeyed the prophet. They listened to what he said. And uh, <clears throat> years ago, I was listening to a teaching on this book, and he mentioned how powerful it is to keep a message short. Uh, there's, or powerful speakers know uh, when to sit down and shut up. So hopefully I can keep this kind of short. <laughs> uh, all right, I need to take a drink of water. It's distracting me. All right. All right, hey guy. Oh yeah, hey guy is also a little confusing and gonna leave us in question. So let's clue into the text. Uh, I'm going to set the stage a bit and kind of tell you what's happened since Zephaniah last week. So Zephaniah, uh, Israelites get or Judah gets conquered by Babylon. They go to exile. Um, they spend 70 years there, and then a king rises to power, and his name is Cyrus. Uh, he's prophesied about in Isaiah that he's the king who's going to let the people go back to Judah. So he lets the people go back to Judah, tells them, and God charges the people to rebuild the temple. And they head back, and they build an altar, and then they kind of get busy with their own things. Uh, they grow wanton for the world and start building a city, houses, uh, their careers, and things like that. Two kings come and go. They had pretty short reigns. And now Darius is king of Persia, who is ruler of Judah, ruling over Judah. Um, and at this time is when Haggai comes on the scene, and he's been given a word 
uh, that the Israelites need to get busy building the temple. And in just three months and 24 days, God is going to reveal himself as a very different God than what the Israelites thought when Haggai first begins delivering his message. You see, God is not doing with the temple what you think he's doing. So, uh, All right, let's jump in. I'm going to start in Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. And we're going to try to read through the whole book. Well, we're not going to try. We're just going to do it. Uh, In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehozadak the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet, Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses, while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, and you harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, and you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Ah, yeah. That was fun to read. Uh, The Lord of hosts is really not holding back on his people. He's telling them what's happening. Um, And that the people have forgotten to do what they were supposed to be doing because they got so busy with their own cares and the worries of the world. Um, But God is still breaking through, and this message is coming at a... a, It's very timely because the Israelites would be mid-harvest right now. And uh, they're probably starting to realize everything they've worked for this year isn't producing quite what they had hoped. And uh, they labored much and gained very little. And I really think verse 6 hits a chord with our current economic state, um, that we're working hard, but there's not as much there as we'd like there to be. Um, Inflation's rising, and... It's getting tough. Um, yet the, and then on top of that, the Lord doesn't really let up on telling them that they're going to be struggling or that they are struggling. Um, but he does give them a task for the coming winter. Uh, let's read verses 7 through 11. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it, that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins. Will each of you busy himself with his own house? Or, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you will withhold the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called... For a drought on the land, in the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. All right. The Lord says, consider your ways. That's the second time he said it in three verses. Uh, God has called his people to stop and ponder what they are working so hard for. saying, I want you to work hard on my house. Build the temple. Well, that's not me. I was like, oh, man, my phone's ringing up here. <laughs> uh, I want you to work hard on my house. Build the temple. Gather materials. You're working for corruptible things. And by the way, if you don't obey me, your current situation is going to get worse. God's not only... Uh, disappointed, but he's going to dry up the land. He's not only going to dry up the land, he's going to dry up the very labor of their hands and man himself. So what do the people decide to do? Let's keep reading. 
Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius King. All right. So after 24 days, the people of Israel decide to give their work to the Lord. Um, I really enjoy how much thought they gave it. It's kind of weird to think that, you know, God told them, I'm going to dry up your land, and it's going to be really hard. And it took them 24 days to decide that they were actually going to fall through and obey him. Um, But at the same time, after three weeks of thinking about it, they knew they were committed. And... uh, Yeah, and so over the three weeks, the people made the commitment to quit working for nothing and give their labors to the Lord. And God, in his unfailing love, on their first day of work when they showed up, gave them but one sentence to the leaders and to the people, I am with you. Oh, how powerful it is to be walking with God. He just does not fail in this. When we are walking in step with him, he will provide his presence. And let's read on. Uh, This is about a month later. So in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the prophet, oh, sorry, on the seventh day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is this nothing in your eyes? Yet now, be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of Israel. Oh, sorry, of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you, when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Do fear not. All right. So, yeah, it's a month later, and uh, the string lines were out. Maybe some footings were set. And they saw the temple they were building was not the temple they thought it was going to be. And uh, God is repeating himself. The people were facing adversity from Samaritans and even themselves. Um, The the Israelites had heard about the temple Solomon made and how how big, how grand, how much gold was in it, silver, all the things. They also knew uh, the one that Ezekiel prophesied about, and this is not that. Uh, And then on the other side, the Samaritans are complaining to King Darius. They're telling him that this temple is kind of lame. And doubt has crept in. So God calls out the leaders and all the people, saying, Be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Joshua. Be strong, all you people of Israel. I'm still with you. Remember, before there was a temple, or even the tent that Moses and your ancestors built, I was with you then, and I'm with you now. I brought you out of Egypt, and I brought you out of Babylon, and we're going to build this temple. And here is why I'm not concerned with the size or the stature of this temple. For thus says the Lord of hosts, I'm in verse 6, yet once... More in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in 
And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. That kind of took a turn. Kind of thinking like, whoa, what kind of temple are, are they building here? God, you're going to shake heaven and earth? You're going to fill it with your glory? Desire of all nations? Well, uh, sorry, this says treasure of all nations. What, what could that be? Well, it's Jesus. Uh, Jesus walked in this very temple that they're building. Uh, he taught. He healed. He corrected the snakes who were profiting from God. He amazed the elders as a little boy with his knowledge of the scriptures. Um, he drew crowds. And he healed the world. He brought peace to the hearts of men. Um, now I'm going to tell you a little story. This week, as I was preparing to speak, I was thinking a lot about my work and how I could better serve the Lord. Uh, and it became apparent to me that I need to focus less on my own physical job and focus more on my family, and my wife, my marriage. So on Friday, uh, I laid down my work, asked my mom to watch our little boys, and me and Amy, and not, or Amy and I went up the still water, had lunch, uh, went for a walk, and then we came home. And it was kind of fun, uh, really hard, and pretty exhausting. You see, the, the Lord entered in, and we had to really reconnect. Uh, we'd been so busy in our lives that we're growing apart, and we didn't really have anything to enjoy about each other anymore. Um, and, I'm sh and I'm sure... Uh, those of you who have been married for a while probably remember days like these um, where you really can't explain it, but after months, year, weeks, maybe even years of just kind of grinding through marriage, all of a sudden the Lord evidently enters in and there is joy in marriage again. Um, and it's new and fresh. So right now, I'm challenging all you husbands Focus on the family. And don't forget that your bride is the very center of the, or the one you're most concerned about. Because without her, the family's broken. And, uh, yeah, show interest in her. Take off of work early one day. Tell her, I got us a babysitter. Uh, and take her out for a good time. And, uh, don't forget to shower first. <laughs> so, moving on. It's been two months, and the foundation of the temple is laid. And I'm picking up in verse 210. All right. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask the priest about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with, the fold, with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? And the priest answered and said, It does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, So is it with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. So with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. And this is when what I said, uh, God is not doing with the temple what you think he's doing really comes to light. I'm sure the people before this were feeling pretty good about themselves, like they had got the foundation laid. 
And they were proud of the work they'd done. Uh, they were proud of their sacrifice. Uh, they were proud. They were proud. And God hits them with this. You aren't holy. You're sinners. And you're unclean. And you need a greater sacrifice than anything you can give to me. That's pretty frustrating. Um, let's read on. 2.15. Now then consider from what... Oh, now then consider from this day onward before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord. How did you fare? When you came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When you came to the wine vat to draw out 50 baths, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and mildew and with hail. Yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day of the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider. Is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed. The vine the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. Um, yeah, God, so God calls to mind how hard the people were laboring before. For so little. Yet now that they've given their time to the Lord's house, God's saying the fields are going to spring with fruit even though the seed's still in the barn. Um, it's almost as if he is saying, uh, you know, it's not really about you farming and working really hard. It's not about you taking the best care, or, well, you should take really good care of your livestock, but it's not about how good of a rancher you are. It's not, a good, it's not about how well you manage your money. Um, it's not how great a product you're creating to sell at the market. Um, he's saying, you're going to have plenty because I am excited about your obedience and trusting me. Um, to lay down your busy schedules and get this temple off the ground. God is leaving us with a very unresolved message. Am I right? In the middle of the book, he reveals the temple and the sacrificial law are not really what he is seeking after or out of you. What he desires is that you trust in his unfailing love, mercy, compassion, and his promises of a greater kingdom than can be found on earth. He's saying, I want you to believe me. I'm going to close with two more sections of scripture. The first is the rest of Haggai, and the latter are the words of Jesus and just what it takes to do his work. All right. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I'm about to shake the heavens and the earth, and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations, and to overthrow the chariots and their riders. And the horses and their riders shall go down, everyone by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord. <clears throat> so, uh, from last week to this week, uh, from the end of Michael's message to now, God is still talking about shaking heaven and earth, and this is on the other side of exile. Uh, so we know there's more to the story. And uh, Michael ended last week talking about the cup of wrath, which we deserve, and Jesus coming to take it to deliver us to the cup of mercy and grace. And this week, we end with the leader of Judah, who is considered a governor, 
He's not even a king. And God is making him a signet ring. Um, something that seals letters, usually worn by a king. Uh, so he's setting a seal. He, well, he's making Zerubbabel a seal. And uh, you fast forward 600 years, and there's two men um, are writing about Jesus. One who walked with him, the other who was interested in him. And the two in their gospel accounts take two different sides of Jesus' parents. One lineage is from Joseph, the other uh, from Mary. And from David, there's only one ancestor that is shared on both sides, and it's Zerubbabel. Uh, God's foreshadowing what is to come. And we know Jesus comes. And in John's Gospel, I guess, I don't mean that. In John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 29, after Jesus feeds the 5,000, he miraculously arrives on the other side of the lake. And the people bow over and begin questioning him. And Jesus leads them to ask the question, how is it that we shall work the works of God? And Jesus responds, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. That you believe in him whom he sent. Um, it's not by physical works that we are saved, but by faith alone. Not one of us in this room will get to stand before God and tell him about how good we were all that we accomplished, how much money we made, the friends we had. None of that will justify us. No, rather our only hope is being sealed by the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. And I look forward to the dreadful day, and that's by God's grace. And if you don't, I urge you to talk with Jesus to let his unfailing love overflow your sinful heart and become a part of the family of God. Give your life to Jesus. Let's pray. Um, Lord, I thank you that I got to share your word. And I thank you for everybody who showed up to listen to your word. And I pray that... Um, if there's anybody right now who um, feels, feels you churning their heart and um, calling you or calling them to receive your spirit, I just pray right now that they might raise their hand and uh, let... All right, I see you. Um, Jesus, I'm so thankful that... Um, you're a good God, and I praise you that uh, you unite us through your spirit. And I pray for those of us who have known you that we would renew that, uh, that commitment to follow you. And Lord, we would go and re re listen to you and obey you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.